Grunge music was a powerful force. It came on strong in the early 90s and it literally changed the music landscape in rock forever. It forever will be a moment in time that was just new, unique, and amazing. Now, that time period came with four amazing bands as well as four iconic albums. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back, music lovers, especially my rock music lovers. Now, when it comes to the grunge movement, there is no doubt that that moment, there was four amazing bands that absolutely stole the show when it comes to that moment on the timeline that is rock roll history. I mean, and, and that obviously being the band Nirvana, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, and Pearl Jam. When it comes to those four bands, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, and Soundgarden, I can definitely say over the course of my lifetime, I have found many people that like one out of the four, two out of four, or none at all. I mean, whatever it is, it's not everybody's flavor, their cup of tea. I mean, not everybody's going to like the same thing I like or the same thing you like. But it's undeniable that those four bands made the biggest impact. Now, when I think of that Seattle movement, I do think of bands like Mud Honey, uh, Mother Love Bone, and the Melvins, among others, that probably I'll say the first two, Mud Honey and Mother Love Bone, not as respected as much. Again, those bands are no longer in existence, but they did help pave the way for the other, well, the big four. There are bands like the Melvins that I'm not going to say underrated because the Melvins have a huge fan base, still going strong, widely respected in the music community, the rock music community, whether it be the underground scene or the mainstream. People love the Melvins, and a lot of the guys from those four bands had ties with the Melvins and were just as big of fans as the rest of us. But it's the fact that those four had the biggest impact, the biggest hits, the most albums sold, and I mean, obviously the most controversy among other things, but those are the big four, whether we like it or not. Let's talk about those four bands for a minute. Now, three out of those four bands, they no longer have their original lead singer. And each one of those bands is because we've lost them. They're no longer with us. Now, different reasoning, well, kind of, just depends how you look at life. Now, most will say if you're a drug addict and you die from an overdose, that you can almost consider it suicide because you know the risk of putting a needle in your arm or anything in your body that possibly poses the risk of death. So you're willing to take that chance. So is it suicide? Is it not? It just depends how you look at it. Obviously, we know Chris Cornell. We lost him to suicide. We lost, well, Kurt Cobain to suicide. It just depends who you are. Are you a conspiracy theorist? Do you believe some of the stories that came out after Kurt's death in April of 94? There's a lot there. I'm not one to dig into that kind of stuff because, well, maybe it's just a bunch of, you know, nothing. Maybe there is something. And if you say the wrong thing or you dig too deep, we know there's a real world out there and we can't always live in the fantasy world. And sometimes you might tap into an area that you shouldn't have and you might never be seen again. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. But we know Pearl Jam still has Eddie Vedder and the band's still going strong today. Now, Alice in Chains, obviously, new lead singer, still out there doing their thing. Obviously, Soundgarden, we, we may never see them perform again. Obviously, it would not be the same band, no more Cornell. And Nirvana, we've seen them perform without Kurt, um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But it'll never be the same. You cannot replace those two guys. You cannot replace Lane Staley as well. The thing is, whether or not those guys are here, that does not affect the fact that we're going to talk about each one of those bands and their four greatest albums. And those four albums might be four of the greatest albums in rock history, period. We're going to talk about each one of these albums by release date. Now, the first one we're going to talk about was released August 27th of 1991. And that being this band's debut album. That band being Pearl Jam and the album 10. Well, 10 by Pearl Jam is obviously considered one of the greatest grunge albums of all time. Now, to me, it has more of a, a very classic rock feel to it now bear with me on this i think really it starts with eddie vedder's voice now eddie vedder's voice out of those four the big four the grunge couturiers we call them those guys all have unique voices i think that's what makes each band unique so if you are a newcomer to rock music and somebody says go listen to this music we called it grunge back in the early 90s it was huge 
and you listen to one of those bands first, whichever it be, maybe Nirvana, maybe Alice in Chains, and then you hear their voice, Lane Staley's voice, and say, okay, this is grunge, and then you go listen to the other three, you're going to see quickly how different each of their voices are. Now, Eddie Vedder's, I think, is just... I'm going to put him as the second best... Wow, oh, man, it's hard to rank that. I'm not going to say singer, man, because they're all amazing. I think I'm going to put Kurt at the bottom of the list, but the other three, I can mix and match them for just singing in general. But that album had definitely a lot of... I'm going to say a lot of inspiration probably from classic bands like Hendrix, Zeppelin, you know, the bands like the Beatles, those guys definitely had an influence and it showed on this album. Hey, really quick, could you please do me a huge favor? Before we continue the video, if you're enjoying it, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Those are two things you can do for me right now. Absolutely free, cost you nothing. That'll help me and this channel grow, which is, that's why I'm here. So please, if you could do those two things for me. Let's continue the video. So 10 by Pearl Jam was not an immediate success. Now, it was one of those pick up the pace slowly kind of albums. Now, by late 1992, it had reached number two on the Billboard 200 chart and it was starting to gain success. Obviously, three of their biggest singles, Alive, Even Flo, and Jeremy were blowing up. Jeremy being one of their most widely recognizable songs. I mean, everybody knows it's probably one of their greatest songs ever. Now, Big help with this because MTV put it in its rotation daily. I mean, you were constantly seeing the music video for Jeremy. Not only that, they garnered two Grammy nominations at the 35th Annual Grammy Awards. Did not win, but to be nominated for that, their first album, it's definitely like a boost of morale. Like, hey, shit, we're doing something good here. You know, the 1993 MTV Video Music Awards, they ended up walking away with four of those awards. So, no doubt... As it started to pick up the pace, the album was clearly getting noticed and clearly people could see that, hey, this band out of Seattle is doing something special here. You know, the album 10, aside from being obviously a great grunge album, I really think that this helped a lot of bands moving forward as far as alternative rock goes throughout the rest of the 90s decade and beyond. No doubt that these guys did something special on their first try, which makes it even that more amazing. I mean, this album did amazing up to date. It's It's been certified 13 times platinum. 13 times platinum. Absolutely amazing by these guys. Obviously, it is it is regarded as their best-selling album to date. It is one of their best-selling albums. And that's not to discredit anything the guys did after that. They did some great work after that. But their 1991 debut album, 10, is a classic gem. And it put Pearl Jam on the map, and they'll forever be known as legends in the world of grunge and in the world of rock and roll. So the next album we're gonna talk about was released the following month after Pearl Jam's 10 on September 24th of 1991. That is when the world will be introduced to Nevermind by Nirvana. So in, in today's day and age, I think if you ask Siri, ask Alexa, go ask Google, whatever, what is the greatest grunge album of all time? I think you might see Nirvana's Nevermind pop up before anything else, along with the rest of the albums we're gonna talk about and more. But I think that's just for the public, the mainstream, the, the casual rock and roll fan, the person that don't even care about rock music. They're just going to bring it up in conversation. Oh, yeah, that, that Nirvana, never mind. That, that was the greatest album at that time, right? Well, that's what they're being told. I personally don't think that, but no doubt this album, well, it helped that genre explode and it put the band Nirvana on another level. So primarily most of the writing on this album was done by Kurt Cobain himself. Now, the label that the Nevermind was released under was DGC. Now, the producer being Butch Vig. Now, you gotta realize, this is their second studio album. Now, the first studio album, Bleach, was released through Sub Pop Records, which was obviously, if, if you know Seattle, you know the grunge movement, If you'll know Sub Pop Records. But that was a big difference, going from Sub Pop to DGC, which is, you know, a branch off of Universal Music Group. Now... It, it's a huge jump, which is why I think the album was so successful. It's really why I think a lot of these albums were successful is because that was the change in the guard from what the music was, the rock music in the 80s, to what it would become in the 90s. These were the bands being promoted. And nothing wrong with that because they're awesome, talented bands. But I think that really helps. Who's producing that album and what label is it under? Now, it did not take Nirvana's Nevermind as long as Pearl Jam's 10 to start gaining success and blowing up. In fact, by early January, 92, the album had already reached number one on the US Billboard 200 charts. 
Now, not only that, the lead single, Smells Like Teen Spirit, literally, and I cannot tell you how many times I've heard this saying, it seemed like it just blew up overnight. And literally, hundreds of people have said that. It, it just, that song was released, it started playing in the US, playing overseas, and it just was instantly loved by millions. And hearing that many people say it, I'm, on, I'm inclined to take their word for it. You know, MTV also helped them huge by putting Smells Like Teen Spirit's music video on constant rotation. Again, just like Jeremy by Pearl Jam. Constantly you were seeing it. It was being shoved down your throat, literally. Which was fine at first, but even Cobain said after a while, it was just like, he was sick and tired of seeing it. Which I'm sure many people were as well. Then you had their other three singles off the album, Come As You Are, In Bloom, and Lithium. Again, constant play on radio airwaves. If there was a video for it, it was constantly being played on MTV. Now this did garner a spot in the Grammy Hall of Fame for Smells Like Teen Spirit, the song, which was huge. It is huge, but more things to come for Nirvana and Nevermind, good and bad. Now, of course, over the course of a year and a half or so, from the 34th annual Grammys all the way to the 35th the following year, they garnered three different nominations, including Best Alternative Rock Album. Now, I can't stress it enough. This album literally blew up overnight. Now, one thing I cannot, I mean, I can't say it enough, Kurt Cobain definitely spawned the attention of a generation. He is the voice of a generation, Generation X. I mean, the, the, the grunge movement and Gen X go hand in hand together, and Cobain absolutely stole the show as the guy to look up to. I cannot take that away from him. Whether he's my favorite, whether Nirvana's my favorite, or this album, you can't take that away from him because he was loved by many, many people, as well as the band and this album. I mean, there's comparisons to the fact that in the early 60s, the British invasion coming over to the U.S. and just completely taking over American pop culture. I mean, it was it was similar to that because all the 80s hair metal bands and the way that metal was perceived and put out to the public in the 80s, everyone says it, and it seemingly seemed as so that it just killed it overnight. Now, again, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I do not believe it killed that 80s sound, those 80 bands, but... It completely overshadowed them to where it seemed like they were completely dead and gone. They were not, and some of them are still standing strong today, still performing, doing great. But Kurt Cobain and Nirvana in this album seemingly took over the world, and it, it can never be taken away from them. This album is certified diamond. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that this is one of the greatest grunge albums of all time. But again, I can also say this. It is one of the greatest albums, rock albums, period. Matter of fact, just albums, not even rock. One of the greatest albums of all time. Now, the next album on this list would be released the following year after Nevermind, September 29th of 1992, this being the band's second studio album. Band Alice in Chains, and it was their album Dirt. Personally, my absolute favorite out of these four. Now, I don't know why, but I can say this, this being my favorite album out of the four we're talking about, but it, it peaked at number six on the Billboard 200, so it did not reach the same heights as the two albums that we discussed. Pearl Jam's 10 and Nirvana's Nevermind does not mean it's not a great album because in fact, again, like I said before, I think it's the best album out of all four, but it didn't garner as much success initially, but has since gone on to get as, just as much respect as the others. Certified five times platinum. I mean, it had garnered five amazing singles, Wood, Angry Chair, Rooster, Down in a Hole. I mean, all amazing songs and to this day they're still played on your local rock station just like the rest of these bands and their songs that just shows the impact it wouldn't be long after that though when the album came out in september by the time january of 93 rolled around they ended up firing mike star their bassist so the original lineup would no longer be intact and then after that it seemed to be a constant streak of bad luck for the band or the guys in it because we ended up losing lane staley in early 2002 so it, it really sucked for the band but they definitely peaked well, I can say they peaked at an awesome moment with an awesome album. No doubt that these guys will forever be known for that album because it is their highest selling album of all time. But I can say this. There was a lot of genius behind that album with Thousand Chains as well. Another cool thing that I think is really cool to go back and look at, their song Wood was featured on the soundtrack for Camera Crow's 1992 film Singles. Now, if you want to go literally take a time warp back to when grunge was in its prime and how the world looked in that moment, Go watch the movie Singles. Absolutely amazing movie. If you've never seen it, you got to check it out. A lot of, I guess you could say, nods and to grunge. And, and completely, that's what the movie's about. I mean, literally, it's an amazing movie. But the fact that Alice in Chains Dirt, there was a lot of dark subject matter behind the lyrics and songs. 
and that's what made grunge so real is the lyrics they were spitting out i mean they were speaking to the real people unlike the 80s hair metal bands those guys came out and said we're going to keep it real which was something new something fresh and i think the reason why it was highly regarded as such a great move for the music industry the rock music industry now jerry cantrell wrote most of the material for the album jerry cantrell without a doubt amazing guitarist and i'm gonna say the brains behind the operation always has been always will be now it also came with Lane Staley writing his first two solo songs together. He wrote How to Feel and Angry Chair, though he wrote them by himself. And Angry Chair being one of the singles off the album. So it was a whole new direction. Guys were getting more, you know, add into the band, uh, more say so, whatever you want to call it. But the drugs, the alcohol, the crazy nights, the stupid stuff, just even though they were coming closer together, it seemed, they were slowly getting pulling apart. So it would be March 8th of 1994 that we would get the next album by the next band. That being the album Super Unknown by Soundgarden. Now I'll tell you this. Though the last released out of these four iconic albums. Um, I don't know how to say it. I think Soundgarden really paved the way for the rest of these guys. They were, we'll get into it. But I think they were the foundation for the rest of these albums. Now unlike the rest of the albums. Super Unknown by Soundgarden came on a lot stronger. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 charts. Now, that's amazing. Now, this album spawned five amazing singles. The entire album is freaking awesome because Chris Cornell's voice is so amazing. So amazing. They actually won two Grammys for two of those singles, Spoon Man and Black Hole Sun, two of their most iconic songs of all time. And not only that, they were nominated for other Grammys, which they didn't win, but that's the common denominator with all these albums and all these bands. They were getting recognition by the, the Grammys. I mean, they were getting nominated for big awards. Not always winning them, but being nominated. Now, the thing with Soundgarden is I not give them a lot more respect. Reason being, again, go watch Cameron Crowe's 1992 film singles. They are portrayed in there quite often. Chris Cornell and the band Soundgarden. And these guys, they really set the foundation. And when I say that, I mean they were grinding from the mid to late 80s before grunge blew up. Those guys were there. They were with the rest of their their guys, the other bands, just trying to make it. And that's why I think Soundgarden, Chris Cornell, the rest of the guys, they can be thanked a lot for what happened in that movement and how it eventually progressed because they didn't give up and they kept grinding. So Super Unknown by Soundgarden ended up going six times platinum. And just like the rest of the albums, they got the recognition and they're still highly regarded as it stands today. The grunge movement in itself, I can say over a five year span, most people say it didn't burn out. I've always said that as strong as it came on was just as strong as it flamed out. I mean, and I don't mean that in a negative. I mean, it really peaked quickly and dropped quickly. And that's just saying that the popularity, I mean, by 1991 all the way till about 1996, it started to dwindle down. That's why, you know, there was a lot of bands that were featured post grunge that probably didn't blow up as much as they would have if they'd came out I guess you could say in 92 as opposed to 96 or 97. But no doubt, a lot of great bands came after that movement. But for that moment in time, those four bands were the most highly regarded, most popular, and these four albums cemented them as legends in rock and roll period. Not just the grunge movement, rock and roll period. Because each one of these four albums, easily, if you put up a top, I'm going to say 200 greatest albums of all time, and I could be wrong on this, I think each four of those albums will be on there. And... Again, you might have to go make it a longer list, but I'm going to say 200. Those albums will be there. Greatest rock albums of all time. And that's a tough task because there's some great ones, but that's how much respect I give those bands, these albums, and let's be honest, man. Some of those iconic songs of all time that we can jam on our radio if they come on, they probably come from one of these albums. So there you go right there. But again, drop in the comment section, what do you think about these four albums? What do you think about the whole grunge movement itself? What do you think about these bands? I want to know what you think. And again, this is no disrespect to any of the other bands that were grinding before this grunge movement blew up and just didn't get as much recognition. They get their respect too. But tell me what you think. Again, thank you for watching. Until next time, go take care of yourself, your friends, your family. Do something great. Become the next icon like these albums. Take care of yourself. I'm out.